Thank you so much. Great to be with you. Wow. Well, I have the privilege of uh, traveling about in the last uh, kind of a little window here, about three, four weeks. I was, uh, last Sunday we were down in, in uh, Fort Worth, Texas with a church plant down there with uh, Justin and Kim Allison and uh, they're kind of in that, that struggle where they uh, had started in September, had a great start, and uh, we're in a theater, 70, 80 people meeting regularly, and then COVID hit, and the theaters closed, and so they were homeless, and uh, things were, were going on, hoping that somehow it would begin to open up, never did, so now they try to rent a building, the building never gets access, and so this week they're back to being homeless again. Uh, trying to figure it out. They're not having to do it uh, that way. So, and, and yet God's still working and they're still alive and the church is still going and God is still working. And so that's kind of how life is sometimes. We have those things that disappoint us, that excite us, that thrill us. And then we have those moments where we have to deal with stuff. This week I get to be with you guys and uh, great to be here. Uh, good to be at Lighthouse. I've appreciated the fellowship, Pastor Bakken. We go way back and uh, working together on camps and all the other things that we've done together. And just to kind of give you a little window, our, our fellowship has about, I think this, this year we listed 92 churches and about 450 ministers and, and spouses and missionaries. About a quarter of our entire listing is missionaries. It's, it's our, our whole fellowship has been strong in missions. And that's part of who we are. And, and kind of our DNA, we, we summed it up in some values. And, these are, these are just a real uh, simple bird's eye view of some of the things that are important to us as a fellowship. The first one is that we are true to the word, use the scripture, that's our basis, what we hang on to, but we're also alive in the spirit. True to the word and alive in the spirit. That balance of anchored in the book, but also alive to the work of the Holy Spirit. The second one is we are independent, but we are intentionally interdependent. Each church has their own... Uh, Governance. They have their own uh, uh, bylaws. They function as a, as a body under the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord of the church. But then we say, you know, we can work together and we can do things together and we can, can affect one another. And we do, whether we know it or not. We affect others and we encourage others. We strengthen others. And, and uh, when people hear about what's going on at Lighthouse, there's an encouragement of what can happen in other places as well. And then the third one is, we function as servant leaders and the importance that we are here as servants, we're not here as lords, and we are here to encourage, lift up, and strengthen. And finally, we are committed to our community and to the world. The Great Commission is for Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts. That's what God has called us to do, and we get to be a part of that. Next week, I'll be out on the West Coast and dealing with a whole different kind of situation. So God's at work, and we give thanks to him for that. And again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I want to talk for a few minutes this morning about what I'm simply describing. And uh, just to, to give you a quick window, one little more window on myself. Uh, Becky and I have been married for, it'll be 53 years this summer, by the grace of God. And uh, we're thankful the Lord gave us three wonderful kids, all serving the Lord. And um, two of them still in Rockford, one in uh, Cape Coral, Florida, and they and their spouses are, are loving the Lord, and then five grandkids, and then the big deal was two of our grandsons are married, and one of them gave us a great-granddaughter, so we are now great-grandparents, and you know, the, you, you've heard about the sticker that grandparents get, if I'd known being a grandparent was this much fun, I'd have done it first, and uh, so we kind of get to double that now as we go to another generation because our youngest grandchild is already 15. So now we get to start over with that little baby and uh, celebrate little Emmy who, with her parents, will be headed June 23rd for Romania to do some church planning work and be involved in uh, OEM while they're over there. Well, this morning, let me take you to Romans chapter 15. And I want to talk about eternal hope in a temporal world. Hope is an interesting um, subject. It's something that we need, something that we live in, something that we hang on to. And yet sometimes hope becomes distorted because we have hope in the wrong things or we have hope in short-term things rather than eternal things. Hope in short-term things will probably always disappoint. 
Hope in the eternal things will never disappoint. Hope that is anchored in our Lord Jesus Christ will never disappoint. Hope that is short-term may not get the yes that we're looking for, but hope that is eternal always has the yes and amen from our Lord and Savior. I need to say that again. God is the one who can say yes, and it never changes. God is the one who, when he says yes, there is a, a security, there is a hope, there is an anchor for the soul that doesn't go away. When we're young and I was once, a long time ago. When we're young and uh, think we're in love and we are looking forward to what life is going to look like, and the most, probably most important decision that we'll ever make is, is other than, than knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, which is the most important, but the second most important decision we'll ever make is who do we marry? And who do we commit our life to? Who do we spend our, 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 engage our life with? And like I said, two of our grandsons, they happen to be our, our second and third grandsons are both married, but their older brother, who's 26, uh, is not married yet. And uh, Andrew has wanted to be married. And he's had a couple of, of good girlfriends and uh, just last week broke up with the, the latest one after a year, year and a half because she just wasn't where he wanted to be spiritually. And uh, that kind of excites us. It's painful, but it's also promising that he's kind of looking in that right direction. But, but in that developing relationship, we, we sometimes say, uh, will she say yes? Or will he say yes? Or I hope he asked me. Or I hope she will respond to me. And, and we struggle with that and, that. and that hope is built on that expectation. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. And we're disappointed if they don't, right? But let me tell you, God says, if you will come to me, it's always yes. Always yes. Always yes in him. So that's our hope. But let me give you just one other little illustration and we'll, we'll dive into this. One of the most probably difficult possible things that any human being could endure would be to be a prisoner of war, especially if there's torture, especially if there's isolation. And prisoners of war who survive, some of them for years, in prison camps had this to say about this subject of hope. Those who had short-term hope usually died. Short-term hope meaning I hope we're out by Christmas. I hope we're out by Easter. I hope we're out by the 4th of July. Because when those things that are short term come and the date passes and the expectation is not fulfilled, there's a disappointment that begins to eat away at the soul. And we begin to feel loss. And, and as we feel that loss, we begin to, to give up some of ourselves. But those who had a long-term hope, hope in God, Almost all of them would say it was their faith that sustained it. It was that trust in God that kept them. And, and that long-term hope that says, I have something to live for beyond tomorrow, beyond next week, beyond next year. I am living for a future and a hope in God. That is where sustaining grace comes. Romans chapter 15. I, I'm going to go to my text, and then I want to back up a little bit in this chapter, if you have your Bibles. In Romans chapter 15, verse 13, is an incredibly key verse. It says this, now may the God of hope, notice that, may the God of hope, the God of hope, he is a God of hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. And get this, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not something that I work up on my own and in myself, but that I understand he is at work in me and his empowering spirit enables me to fulfill his life and purpose. So let's take a quick look at it. First of all, he starts this chapter by saying this. 
that in, in, in verse 4, these things were written before, were written for our learning that we through patience and comforts of the scripture might have hope. The scripture stories are not just given to us for a novel or good reading or bedtime stories or a religious obligation. The scriptures are given to us as a revelation of God's character and how God works in people. And the scriptures are incredibly honest. They tell us the bad stuff with the good stuff. It isn't just all the glorious victories. There's also the incredible agonies. There's the, there's the defeats as well as the victories. There's the sense that sometimes things don't go well. And yet God is still there and he is with his people. It's, it's the, the incredible help to see that in times of difficulty we don't give up, we look up. Remember the story just reading recently in Acts of Paul on his, on his uh, third journey as he's on the way to Rome. And as the, the ship is going to be taking him to Rome and they have come by Cyprus and, and they come by a place called Fair Havens. And then he, he says, uh, uh, you, you need to stay here. But the people decided, no, we want to get to another another destination and so they take off with the ship and and then they end up in an incredible two week long storm and and all hope has been given up they have thrown all the the uh, grain over they've thrown the tackle over and 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 Paul finally comes to him and says listen guys you should have listened to me but because even though you didn't the Lord is with us and an angel of the Lord came to me last night and he told me that we is going to save all of us but the ship will be lost he had hope because he knew where he was going. And what was the reason for this? God said, you're going to get to Rome. And Paul was going to get to Rome, no shipwrecked or not. He was going to get there, and God gave him 172 people along with that. Well, let's, let's look at this. We serve a God who is what? A God of hope. Our trust is in him. It is the trust in the one who reigns over the Gentiles. Our trust is not in politicians or other leaders. Our trust is in God. We have been included in God's plan, and Jesus has given us that great hope. But I want you to notice something that he says here. It's, it's like this is a prayer or a blessing. You can take it either way. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Notice that phrase, in believing. Hope is activated by our faith. Hope is, hope is activated by our trust. And so what is it that we are going to believe? Well, one of the Old Testament stories is of Israel leaving Egypt. And you know the, the story, if you've ever read it, where as they're getting ready to leave Egypt and God says, I'm, I'm going to send you out. And I'm going to send you out with blessing. And so when they're getting ready to leave, there are 10 plagues that take place. The last one where the firstborn die and the Israelites are chased out of Egypt and they're, they're given all kinds of, of plunder and, and they leave. And they, they, the first thing that happens to them is they're having the shout and the dance on the way out. Huh? We are, we're out of Egypt, hallelujah, glory be to God. And as they're going along, things are going good until somebody in the back of the bus, if you will, at the back of the line, looks back and sees dust coming as the chariots of Pharaoh are coming to bring him back. And all of a sudden, the, the, the word goes all the way up to the front of the line, up to Moses, and it's, it's Moses, they're coming after us, they're going to kill us. And, 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 and on this side, there's a big wall, and on that side, there's a sea. We're stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea, as they say. Here we are. What are we going to do? What does God do? God takes a cloud, moves it to the back. He blinds the Egyptians for a season. And then says, Moses, take your rod, put it over the sea. And the sea opens. All of Israel goes across. As the cloud follows them, the Egyptians are chasing them. And, and, and when all of the Israelites are out of the sea, Moses turns around, the rod again. And the Egyptian army is drowned. Now, now, let me just throw this in for free. Uh, there are critics who say, well, it wasn't really a deep sea. It was just a shallow place and there were reeds there. And they kind of, you know, the wind kind of opened it up a little bit. And they were able to get across. 
And I just say this, you choose your miracle. A deep sea that they go across that drowns the Egyptians or a shallow body of water where all the Egyptians get out of their chariots, lay on their faces and drown. <laughs> Pick your miracle. <laughs> Isn't it amazing the critics, you know? You, you got a miracle either way. I don't care which way you want to go, but I, I choose to believe it was a deep sea and they, 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 they drowned. They got stuck. So the Israelites have seen that incredible miracle. They go through the wilderness a couple of years. They eat manna. They've had quail. They've gotten water. And every day there's a pillar of fire, a pillar of cloud. Every night there's a pillar of fire. The presence of God is there. But that experience didn't sustain them because they failed to believe. Fast forward. They're now at the edge of the promised land. At the edge of the promised land, they send in 12 spies, one from every tribe. They go in, they check out the land, they come back with an incredibly good report. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. But there's one problem. There are giants in the land. And the giants in the land, when they looked at us, we were like grasshoppers that they could just stomp on and squash. Now that was bad enough. Big boys are a problem. But the greater problem was what they believed about themselves. And we were grasshoppers in our own sight. That little phrase out of Numbers 13 describes why some folks struggle with hope and life. Because if I see myself as less than a conqueror, if I see myself as less than a victor, if I see myself as less than one who is full of hope and expectation, if I see myself as unable to accomplish what God has set before me, I have seen myself as a grasshopper rather than a giant killer. Joshua and Caleb said, let's go. We are well able to overcome them. Fast forward again, 45 years later, Caleb and Joshua, the only two left of those 10 spy, 12 spies, and Caleb says, give me the mountain. Give me the mountain. I don't want the flat land. I don't want the easy land. I want the mountain because that's what they said couldn't be taken and we're going to take it in the name of the Lord. Now, how do we get there? I think David illustrates that when he takes on Goliath. David had enjoyed victories in his life. When David is with his flock of sheep and he says a lion and a bear had come to take the sheep probably separate times, maybe many times. And he said, I killed him. I killed the lion and I killed the bear. The Lord helped me and this giant will be like that lion and like that bear. Too often when God answers prayer and God does something significant in our lives, we tend to forget it when we face the next giant. We tend to lose sight of it when we face the next challenge. We tend to forget that God has sustained us and kept us and been with us and that we can have hope in him because he has been with us in the past and he will be with us in the future. Hope or fear activated by what we believe. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope, abound in hope, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice joy and peace are part of that. Joy and peace are a fulfillment of that. Joy and peace are what sustains us in that. Let me just give you one other illustration. Jeremiah is writing to 
the people of Israel who are in captivity and they have a 70 year captivity. And they have prophets who are trying to tell them you're going to be out in a year or next year or next month or whatever. And Jeremiah says this from the Lord. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Even if it's a 70 year trial. Jeremiah 29. Job himself has that living redeemer. I know that my redeemer lives and I will yet see him in my flesh. There was an eternal hope there. So, so let me get this to us. We have to have an eternal hope or we're going to end up with hopeless fatalism. Paul writes something very fascinating in 1 Corinthians 15. As he's writing about the resurrection and the, the, the life that is yet to come, he writes about it this way. He says, if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men the most to be pitied. Now, why would he say that? If there is no future, why should I crucify the flesh? Why not indulge? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The world says, just have at it. Enjoy life. It's only, you're only going to go around once. The old beer commercial, it's as good as it gets. Sorry, friend. There's stuff that can get way better than this. Way better. See, Paul understood that there is a future that was worth any sacrifice in the present. What sustains us for the future is when we have a hope that endures, knowing that death is not the end of life, it's a transition into new life. It's the place where we are absent from the body but present with the Lord. It's the place where there's no more tears, no more crying, no more death, no more sorrow. And we're not hastening that transition, but we are embracing its reality at some point and that's the hanker for my soul. I hang on to that hope because I know that my Redeemer lives. It's been an interesting observation that was made. Oh, you might have been there, Tim, when Don Wickstrom uh, down in New Glarus made this observation about COVID early on. And he said, I, I, I came to this conclusion. Am I living to not die or am I living to live? And the emptiness in the world is that we've got a lot of people who are living to not die. They're just trying to stay alive somehow that I can live for another day or another year or, or another week or whatever the case may be because this is all there is. But it's not all there is. Now, I'm not recommending carelessness or anything of the sort. It's, 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 it's not that at all. But it's that if I have eternal hope in my, my heart, I don't need to live in fear and in panic because I live in expectancy of a future and a hope that is secure in God. That's what I'm hanging on to. That's the thing that sustains me. That's what allows me to function and continue to function without living in, in, a, in, a, in a panic state. How do we get there? What we believe affects how we think. Philippians 4 age is the, is the uh, mental health verse, whatever things are good, whatever things are pure, what, you know, that whole line. Think on these things. Meditate on the things that are good. Are you meditating on your hope or are you meditating on your fear? Are you meditating on your future or you're meditating on your failures? Are you, what are you meditating on? It's what we think of that is going to sustain us and keep us and walk us through difficult times. Now, notice in this text what he says. He says that you may abound in hope, abounding by the power of the Holy Spirit. Probably what most of us are familiar with Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The, the word power that is used there, the Greek word is dunamis. That's a word from which we get dynamite, dynamo, uh, dynamic. Those words come from, from dunamis. Now, for, for some of us, for some Pentecostals, uh, their experience with the Holy Spirit is kind of like dynamite. 
It's exciting. It's glorious. But I think that if we're going to have an effective life in the Spirit, that it has to be, and, and I'm not discounting those wonderful experiences. I mean, God meets us where we are. He can pour out his spirit. He can do all kinds of things that we can't understand. But what I want to say is this. There is a dynamic dynamo of the spirit that allows us to live in hope. It allows us to live with consistency. It allows us to live with a continuum. It allows us to be able to, to go through difficult times. A dynamo is like a, a flywheel. A flywheel, for anybody that doesn't understand what a flywheel is, uh, I go back to my farming days when we had the old John Deere tractors, the, two, the Johnny Poppers, we called them. Pop, 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 you know, those. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Most of you have no clue. <laughs> so let me educate you very quickly. These tractors had this heavy, heavy flywheel that kept the engine running because it would only do like a poop, a poop, a poop, but it had incredible torque and power because that flywheel kept the engine moving. Uh, we had experience when I was on the farm in Madison and, and uh, we had a 4020. We just had a big new 4020, and my dad got it stuck in the, in, the, uh, in the marsh, and we hooked a 3010 on it, and the 3010 was just kind of sitting there spinning away. And we got an old 60, one of the old flywheel-generated two-cylinder engines, and, and we hooked that onto the front of the thing, and every time the engine hit, we would move ahead a foot. It was just kapoom, kapoom, kapoom. Why? Because the flywheel was giving us momentum. The dynamic of the Holy Spirit, and I don't know if I can communicate this effectively enough or not, but the dynamic of the Holy Spirit working in us on a continual daily basis. We feed the Spirit. How do we feed the Spirit? It's, it's His Word. It's the truth of His Word that feeds the Spirit. It's our, our time of communion with God in prayer when we allow him to saturate our lives. It's allowing his spirit to become the, the director and work of our lives. You see, back to my earlier story, we need to recognize that the Holy Spirit is initiated in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and and our, our, our relationship with God through Christ and salvation, but it is sustained through intimacy. It is sustained as we spend time together. My wife does not like to go even an hour without talking to me, let alone days or weeks. She want, I'll, I'll call her on the way home. I saw her as I left. Why? Because she wants to know we're connected. She wants to know that I'm thinking about her. She wants to know that I'm going to be with her. And so that whole sense of intimacy is what the Holy Spirit is desiring. And it's the intimacy that develops the sustaining hope and life that we need in Christ. It's what takes us through the difficult times. It takes us through the challenging times. It takes us through the transition times. It takes us through all of those different, different situations. See, experience and encounter also require renewal. Interesting, two chapters after that initial baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, there's another baptism, another outpouring. There's another time the Spirit is poured out. We need a, an ongoing outpouring. We need to have that continual hunger. Lord, pour your Spirit out in us. Let it live through us. Sometimes we, we say, well, you know, if we could just see a miracle or if we could just see God do something supernatural, then, you know, that would do it. You know, that would start revival. That would change everything. And it could. But too often, the experiences and encounters don't change the heart unless there's a transformation 
of spirit. The children of Israel had seen the plagues of Egypt. They'd seen the deliverance across the Red Sea. They'd seen the pillar of cloud and fire. But they didn't believe God could deliver them into the promised land. He could deliver us out of the world, but he couldn't get us all the way there. He could get us started on a journey, but he couldn't finish the journey. He could, he could start the change in my life, but he couldn't finish what he started. No, this is the confidence that we have that he who has begun a good work in you will continue or complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's the promise from Colossians 1. God will sustain and will continue and will complete. Listen, listen to this. When they get to the edge of the land the second time, Joshua is going to be leading them in. They send two guys this time. They go to Jericho. Jericho, a walled city, big enough walls that people could live in the walls. Some have said that they could have chariot races on the top of the walls. It was so, so big and so impenetrable. The two spies are staying with Rahab. And listen to what Rahab says to these two spies. We heard what God did to the Egyptians. And effectively, she's saying, and we are terrified of you guys. 45 years later, someone who is in an impenetrable city is saying, we are scared to death that you guys are going to destroy us because the God who took you over the Red Sea, the God who delivered you from Egypt, we've heard about him, and we have no hope against that God. It might have helped him to have heard that the first time. Huh? Think about it. But that fear of the Lord was still there, and they had every reason to have every confidence because God was with them. I need to wrap this up quick. We have hope for the future. We have an eternal hope that sustains us through the temporary difficulties of life. You know, I think one of the enemy's greatest attacks is to try to convince people you have no worth, you have no value, you have no purpose, you might as well end your life and check out because there's no hope. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come to give abundant life. The enemy wants to take away every shred of hope. But I want to remind us that we have hope in him. There is an eternal hope. We are in this corrupt world, groaning, praying, God, help us and deliver us, release us from this place. But let me give you one more thing. How do we live and walk in the spirit? Jesus gives us the illustration, it's not my will, it's your will. I'm seeking to please you, Father, not myself. Recognize that the spirit is with you. John 14, Jesus said, you know who the Spirit is. He's been with you and he will be in you. You and I now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He resides within his people. And because he resides within us, we have confidence that he is with us. Romans chapter 8 probably ends with one of the greatest descriptions of that hope. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Hope in God. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Hope in God. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who, is he, who condemns. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Hope in God. We have one who is praying for us and interceding on our behalf. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Sometimes don't you wish that we didn't have the second part of verses? This is one of those. Shall tribulation or distress 
or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Can those things separate us from God? Not if our hope is in him. It doesn't matter if everything in this world falls apart. Our hope is still in the one who is holding our hand. I love Psalm 73. He says, you hold me by my right hand and afterward you will receive me into your glory. That's our great hope in him. For your sake, we're killed all day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all of these things, what things? The tough things, the difficult things, the disappointing things, the painful things, the destructive things, the betrayals, all the other stuff. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hope in God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's where our hope is. <clears throat> and so my prayer for us is may the God of hope fill you fill you with all joy and peace in believing that like the dynamic dynamo, you can go through the tall weeds, you can go through the difficult times, you can go through the challenges of life because he is with you. He walks with us. He encourages us. He strengthens us that you may abound, abound. That's way more than enough. Huh? Abounding is having something to give away. Abounding is having something to share. Abounding is having something that is so excess, either I'm going to build bigger barns or I'm going to give it away. Huh? Think about it. And God says, give it away. <laughs> Bless others. Abounding in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for your word today. Lord, I thank you for Lighthouse Church and for those who call this place their spiritual home. Father, I pray blessing. Lord, I pray in, in, in the challenges of life, and Lord, we've been through them this year. The last 12 months have been the craziest probably any of us have ever seen or lived in. And yet, Lord, you have been with us, and you give us hope. So, Father, I pray, may you sustain, may you keep, may you guard, may you provide in every way that the name of Jesus might be glorified. And Father, I pray, if any here today don't have that hope, Lord, you are the giver of hope because you're the giver of life because your son died in our place. I see, just take another moment if I can. So we're praying this morning, it's, it's possible you're in the room and this is just what's striking me right now that Maybe you feel you're beyond hope. Maybe you feel that stuff I've done or whatever, I, I don't know that I could ever be forgiven, but I want to tell you, the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to cleanse us from all sin. There's, there's nothing that is beyond his ability if we repent and turn to him. Or maybe you've just not paid much attention and you've kind of been living life and you've never really said, I need Jesus. I need that eternal hope. I need to hang on to him and nothing else. I'm not going to put my hope in temporal things. I'm not going to put my hope in short-term stuff. I'm going to put my hope in the one who lives me, lives in me, and the one who, who is preparing a place for me. We pause just a moment. That's you. and You say, I, I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I need, to, I need to have the hope you're talking about, and I don't have it right now, but I want it. Would you just lift a hand where you're sitting and say, by that upraised hand, please pray for me. Anyone as we pause a moment. Father, we just thank you that you're the one. You'll sustain us. You'll keep us. You'll guard us. Bless your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing Jesus Messiah to close out this morning. Let's just start... Uh, with the bridge, our hope, all our hope is in you. We recognize, Lord, our hope is in you, Lord Jesus, and we, we fix our eyes on you, God. All our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. All the glory to you, God.
Messiah. Let's sing it. Jesus Messiah. You're the name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. Amen. Messiah, Lord of all. He became sin for us. Oh, he became sin. Who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness? And he humbled himself. And carry the cross Oh, love so amazing Love so amazing Jesus Messiah Oh, the name above all the bread oh his body the bread his blood the wine broken and poured out oh for love the whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. love so amazing Messiah, oh, you're the name above all names. Oh, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, you're the rescue for sinners. from heaven Oh, Jesus Messiah Oh, Lord of all Let's sing all our hope is in you and all our hope is in you All our hope
morning. You are Lord of all. You are King of kings, Lord, and our hope is in you. And so we press into you, Lord. We press into that truth, God. Remind us of that this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Remember, we have uh, the uh, annual business meeting um, starting in about 20 minutes, 11.15, I think. 11.15, yeah. We'll be back in here then.